There is so much content embracing this subject. From XSS discovery to all kinds of cross-site scripting filter bypasses, but this video will explain these aspects and give you references to go deeper for each one. Hopefully, it will be a general XSS guide for you to come back to when you need anything related to XSS. During this episode, you will learn the following. How does cross-site scripting work? This is where you will understand the underlying concepts which allow for a cross-site scripting vulnerability to happen. You can't understand the rest if you don't understand this section. Then, we will talk about what are the types of cross-site scripting. We will explore all the different cross-site scripting types with examples. Then, we will explain where to find cross-site scripting. In this section, I will share with you the different injection contexts where cross-site scripting might occur. And then, we will move to how to test for cross-site scripting. In this section, you will learn the different approaches to testing for cross-site scripting, from manual to automated. We will talk about cross-site scripting impact and what you can do with it once you found it. And then we will talk about how to prevent cross-site scripting. And we will talk a little bit about cross-site scripting filter bypass. By the end of this video, I will share cross-site scripting cheat sheets and references for you to dig deeper. So let's start first by explaining how does XXS work. Web applications typically serve HTML to the web browser, which typically contains JavaScript to instruct them how to perform many operations, like creating an interactive user experience, making API calls, etc. Web applications also process user inputs and show the results in the rendered HTML. For example, when you write a comment, the application stores it and shows it in the comments section. You might also think about the profile data that you populate and then they get shown back to the users. Well, cross-site scripting happens when the application fails to properly validate user input, when the web browser processes it. Therefore, an attacker injects arbitrary JavaScript code inside the vulnerable application. When the victim navigates to the vulnerable page, the web browser runs the malicious JavaScript code. To continue on the previous example, an attacker can insert JavaScript code in the comments field. As a result, when the victim's web browser renders the HTML comments page, the attacker's JavaScript code runs against the victim. Let's see that in the OWASP WebGoat challenge. So we are here in challenge 7 in WebGoat. I've already covered how to install WebGoat and I also have prepared a lab machine for you to just download and get your hands dirty. Feel free to download the virtual machine which contains WebGoat and OWASP Juice Shop, all configured in the link below. In this challenge, we are going to experiment with reflected cross-site scripting. As you can see here, we have some inputs of the quantity related to each product in, the sh in our shopping cart, and we can purchase these items using our credit card. So the idea here is to try to find where we can inject a cross-site scripting payload which gets returned back to us. So let's try the manual approach. We're going to just insert an image tag and see what happens. And let's purchase. And here it says that we need to enter a valid number. So let's get rid of our payloads here. And just hit the purchase button. So we have a, a GET request with our fields populated here. And as you can see here, we have our image tag URL encoded. And you can see here that we have the start of our payload, but there is nothing left here. So let's inspect this part and see the code. And there you have it. Our image tag has been inserted as part of the HTML which was returned to us from the server. So this is a clear indication that this is potentially a reflected cross-site scripting. So let's verify that. It seems that the vulnerable input field is the credit card number. And let's uh, inject an alert. Now if we hit the purchase button, normally we should see a pop-up appearing. And there you have it, 
a pop-up containing one, two, three, as we set here. There are three types of cross-site scripting. First, you have the reflected cross-site scripting. As the name suggests, reflected cross-site scripting happens when the backend reflects untrusted user input into the HTML result page. In order to target a victim, the attacker must entice him or her to click on the malicious link so that the pop-up triggers on his or her web browser. I think the main points here to take from this type of cross-site scripting, the URL must contain the cross-site scripting payload and the resulting HTML page must contain the unvalidated cross-site scripting payload. The second type is stored XSS. In this type, the cross-site scripting payload gets stored in the backend and served back on another feature of the application. Let's consider a comment feature, for example, where users comment on an article and list all the comments. An attacker injects the payload. Therefore, any victim which navigates to the comment page will see a pop-up in his or her web browser. In this type, you don't have the need to include the cross-site scripting payload in the URL each time an attacker targets the victim. And finally, you have DOM cross-site scripting. It's a special case of reflected cross-site scripting. In fact, the payload doesn't reach the server. Instead, it ends up in a JavaScript piece of code. For example, suppose you have a web page which redirects users based on the hash value. Generally, to find DOM XSS, you need to dig into the JavaScript code and see where user input get injected in the JavaScript code or in the page in general. So we're going to inspect the elements and see the debugger tab. And here you can find a lot of JavaScript files. So we have a Goat router here, which allows to define client-side routing. And this means that the part after the hash here is our route. So let's see what are the routes that we have. It's under the view folder, Goat router. So here we have all the routes which are defined. So for example, you have the lesson and the name slash the page number, which correspond to exactly what we have here. This is the first element, which is lesson and then slash the name. In this case, it is cross site scripting dot lesson and then slash page number, which is in this case 10. And this routes to the lesson page route handler. Notice that we have a test slash parameter here, which routes to the test route. Let's see where this test route is located. So it seems that it takes a parameter and then it calls the test handler with that parameter. Let's look for this test handler. Let's see in the lesson controller. So it prints test handler in the console and then it invokes the show test parameter with a parameter inside it. It's inside the lesson content view, which is located here. So this is what happens. We are taking this parameter, then we find the element with lesson content class, and then we're using an HTML function to inject our parameter without any validation. So this is a clear indication that we can inject whatever we want. So let's test this. We're going to target the path after the hash in the URL. And remember, the route is test slash and then the parameter. Write a dummy string. This text gets printed. And if you inspect this element, you see that it has the lesson content class and it, which contains our parameter. So what happens if we inject a malicious payload? Okay, so as you can see here, we have our image injected. We can now run our alert by saying source equals a dummy source and then on enter, please alert one, two, three. And there you have it. We've managed to trigger a cross-site scripting without even touching the server, and this is 
a demonstration of DOM cross-site scripting. Feel free to read more on the, each of these types of cross-site scripting with examples in the blog post linked below. When you find a cross-site scripting vulnerability which cannot exploit other users, it is called a self cross-site scripting. For example, you can target other users with your shipping address shown in your private profile. Therefore, you need to chain it with another vulnerability, like CSER, for example, to prove a concrete impact. Now that you understand what is cross-site scripting and what are the types of that vulnerability, let's understand where it can be injected. You can find cross-site scripting in many injection contexts, depending on where your input gets inserted. First, you have the most obvious one, which is cross-site scripting in HTML tags. When you notice your user input inside HTML tag, you have to test if you can inject arbitrary tags. As you can see here, suppose that your malicious user input gets inserted inside an h1 tag. You can replace your payload with an image tag, and if you see a broken image in the result, this is a strong indication that you can achieve a cross-site scripting. There is another injection context which happens in HTML attributes. In this case, you can inject arbitrary ar attributes or escape from attributes context. And then you have cross-site scripting inside JavaScript. And this basically means that your user input gets inserted in a JavaScript code. In this case, you can try to inject a valid JavaScript code that could potentially trigger a cross-site scripting. Sometimes you have JSON response from an API with a content type of text HTML. If this happens, you can try to inject, for example, an image tag and see if your web browser gets a broken image. Because cross-site scripting can trigger in many injection contexts, you can use cross-site scripting polyglots, which are designed to cover as many contexts as possible. There are many approaches that you can follow to hunt and test for cross-site scripting. The first is manual and error-based testing. This is the most basic approach. Basically, you inject a payload in all the fields that you find. Whenever an XSS triggers, you will see a pop-up. Although you can find cross-site scripting vulnerabilities with this basic technique, it is somewhat tedious. Besides, there are many cases where you will not see a pop-up. For example, the cross-site scripting can trigger in a separate application run by an agent. This leads us to the second approach, which is manual but blind-based testing. This approach increases your chance of finding cross-site scripting. Basically, instead of relying on a pop-up as a proof, you can inject a callback to a web server, which you control. When a cross-site scripting triggers, you will get a callback to your server. There are many tools which simplify this process and provide more information when the cross-site scripting triggers. You can use Beef XSS or the XSS Hunter tool for that purpose. And finally, you have a, the automated approach. And this is where automated scanners come into play. For example, if you use Burp Suite Pro or OWASP Zap, we demonstrated in the SQL injection hands-on tutorial how you can use both of them to target specific vulnerabilities. Besides, there is a rising tool currently on beta, Knock XSS, which specializes in finding reflected and DOM XSS at the moment. Now, when you find a cross-site scripting vulnerability, you can prove impact in many ways. It's like you've got a chair in front of the victim's web browser. You can perform almost all the operations the user can do on the vulnerable application. For example, you can forge almost all requests. If the application, for example, allows you to edit the email without asking for a password, you can forge a request using JavaScript and edit the email. Then, when you reset the victim's password, you will receive the password reset link in your email address. Therefore, you will achieve an account takeover. You can also steal cookies and sensitive data if they are not protected. The following JavaScript code will exfiltrate the victim's cookie of a vulnerable web application. It inserts an image with an ID XSS in the vulnerable page. Then it sets its source attribute to point to your attacking website while appending the victim's cookie. When the victim loads the page, you will get the cookie in the cookie parameter. You can use cross-site scripting to redirect your victims to a malicious website, which might be an exact replica of the original application's login page. Usually, people don't pay attention to the address bar, especially if they are on mobile. 
You can also deface a web page. This technique is usually used by hacktivists to harm the image of the target. You might think that the best approach to prevent cross-site scripting would be to sanitize user inputs. Unfortunately, this is not the case. In fact, hackers always find bypasses to cross-site scripting filters. Let's see an example of a poorly written cross-site scripting filter. Let's see how we can exploit a stored cross-site scripting. Let's first log into our account. And if we go to the profile page, you can see that we have a bunch of input fields here. Let's target the username and let's insert our normal string. Now, if you refresh the page, you should see that we have our response stored here. So what happens if I inject an image tag? As you can see here, we have part of our payload injected here. Let's verify if we have an image tag inserted or it's just a filter. So here we have our image tag which is properly injected. Let's now verify if we can insert a full script. Because we didn't get an alert, it, this means that there is some kind of filter which is sanitizing our input. Notice how the resulting output is, is shown here. So remember, we injected this part and all this string was removed and we ended up with just uh, alert and then XSS. Let's verify this hypothesis once more. Let's try with the dummy div and see if our hypothesis holds true. So normally if the filter is looking for anything in a tag and then the next character, we should see this part removed. Okay, indeed we have, we've now understood how the filter works. So let's try to bypass this cross-site scripting filter. And the idea here is now maybe the filter will remove this part and then we will be left with our script tag. And now we have it. Our cross-site scripting has triggered because we were able to fill, to bypass the poorly written filter which was just sanitizing our input in a way which doesn't cover all the use cases. OWASP provides the cross-site scripting filter evasion cheat sheet which hackers typically use to bypass cross-site scripting filters. The basic idea to prevent cross-site scripting is to tell the web browser how to differentiate between HTML and the data. You do that by properly encoding the data. For example, you can perform HTML entity encoding to transform the malicious user input image tag into this format. When the browser sees that string, it doesn't consider it an image tag. Of course, you need to take into consideration each injection context. That's why you should use an encoding library. For example, OWASP encoder allows you to properly encode user inputs to prevent XSS in Java. Of course, cross-site scripting is a big topic. I've tried to make it as exhaustive as, a, as I can. There are many cross-site scripting payloads on GitHub repository. There are many tools which are interactive that allows you to build cross-site scripting payloads. And there are cheat sheets on OWASP. So make sure to read the latest section of the blog post linked below which contains URLs to these references. And that was it. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. If you are not subscribed yet, hit the subscribe button and enable notifications so that you know when a new video is up. Until then, stay curious, learn new things and go find some bugs.